Hi, my name's Vince Sheehan, and today I'd like to talk about Stalin Waiting for Hitler, 1929 to 1941, by Stephen Kotkin. Um, this is the central um, volume of a three uh, volume uh, biography of Stalin. The last volume isn't out yet, but I read the first volume a couple of years ago, Paradoxes of Power and uh, Waiting for Hitler has been out a couple of years, but I've just got around to reading it. And uh, they really are uh, terrific, okay? Now, I'd just like to share my thoughts on these and, you know, just perhaps a summary of what this is about. So, um, in the first volume, Paradoxes of Power, 1878 to 1928, it's really about the rise of Joseph Stalin from obscurity, from poverty, to eventually being the General Secretary of uh, the Soviet Union, succeeding Lenin, although Lenin uh, didn't want Stalin to succeed him, which caused Stalin uh, a great deal of grief, and also about Stalin um, trying to rid himself of Trotsky, who's like this big thorn in the side. Um, at the end of the first volume, the collectivization of, the, of agriculture has uh, been initiated. And that's where we uh, pick up here with uh, this. Now, of course, the central message of this, as the title suggests, is Stalin reacting to and um, navigating the challenges of the rise of Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany in the 30s. And, the, um, and also, not only Hitler, but also the, uh, the general geopolitical climate of the time, including um, the Spanish Civil War, imperialist Japan and, and China too, as well as Stalin's dealings with Britain and France as well, and to a lesser extent the USA. So they've kind of got a very big scope. Of course, in this book, The Terror is, uh, is covered as well. The book's in five parts. Um, each part having um, four or five sections um, and um, I've put the structure of Kotkin's um, train of thought uh, which is chronological in a, a, a brief slideshow at the end. Now the first part is called Equal to the Myth and this uh, picks up where we left off with volume one with the collectivization of the farms. Millions of people in the USSR are basically turned into slaves as their uh, produce is taken away from them by the state and is then um, basically sold, exported, um, so that uh, Stalin's uh, military and industrial aspirations can be uh, fulfilled. The collectivization of the farms basically pays for factories in the cities. This creates an, a, a terrible famine in which millions upon millions of people suffer and die. The depths of human misery are just appalling. Cannibalism is reported, etc. It really is a terrible effect of Stalin's decision to uh, collectivise the farms. Then in a parallel uh, story, we hear about Hitler's rise to power in Germany. And uh, that's very much um, a thrust of this book, having Stalin's story, Hitler's story, until the two converge by the end of the book. We also have, um, you know, a kind of summary of the USSR's relations with other countries around Europe, as well as the adoption of social realism in the arts. Uh, we have Zdanov, who, uh, who very much uh, promulgated a particular way writers, composers, artists, visual artists were going to um, help support the regime through their work. And woe betide if you didn't do that. Of course, famously, Shostakovich is a person who fell foul of this. Um, and there's this dichotomy here, the people who do pander to the, uh, the party line uh, generally their art is far more inferior than those um, people who, who are free from it. Uh, one of the writers, 
of course at this time uh, uh, Mikhail Bulgakov who, uh, who wrote Master and Margarita of course. It's also it's worth noting that Kotkin makes the point of Stalin very much playing the capitalist uh, nations off each other. So um, and Stalin very much is a kind of rather wily figure and he's hoping that um, France, Germany, England will kind of be at war with each other at some point, uh, thus weakening themselves and putting uh, the Soviet Union in a more powerful position. And of course hoping for a Europe-wide socialist revolution. In the fourth chapter of um, this first part, uh, a central uh, event happens which casts a huge pull across uh, under the next 10, at least 10 years. And that's the assassination of Kirov. Um, Kirov was a fellow Georgian, very friendly with Stalin. He rose up the ranks of the Bolshevik party, but he was assassinated. And um, this really kind of put Stalin in a tailspin. And this really is the genesis of the terror, this awful situation uh, in which Stalin was continually purging the people in office around him. It all stems from uh, this assassination of Kirov. It almost provided an excuse for Stalin to do these abominable things. This first part ends with Hitler taking the Rhineland um, in defiance of the Treaty of Versailles. And of course this begins the, the um, policy of appeasement from, uh, from Britain and France, etc. Uh, I suppose epitomised by Neville Chamberlain. So part two, terror of statecraft, um, as it suggests, is all about the, the terror which, in which um, um, so-called Trotskyists uh, were purged from the party. There's the, um, the show trial of um, Kamenev and uh, Zinoniev, and um, it really is incredibly frightening. It's almost as if no one is safe. Stalin just rounds up those who he perceives as possible rivals. But not only that, he just goes through the whole of the Red Army, the generals of the Red Army, the upper top brass, the NKDV, the uh, secret police, and uh, no one is safe. And it just creates this in appalling atmosphere of, uh, of dread and just fear. Um, people were tortured to confess things that had nothing to do with. Um, it really was a terrible situation. And uh, it's all, it all kind of stemmed from Kirov's assassination. Um, we also have Stalin's response to the Spanish Civil War at this point. Um, Stalin is encouraged to support the, um, the socialists in Spain, somewhat reluctantly, um, but he, offered, he provides arms, etc. Stalin was also um, uh, fighting a war on his eastern borders of Japan and involved with the political situation in China. And it's also in this chapter we have the rise of Leventry Beria who eventually takes over the NKVD uh, from Yetsov, who is uh, eventually disposed. Part three, Three Card Monty, takes us up to the uh, eve of Operation Barbarossa, the, the, the Nazi invasion of the US of Russia. It begins with um, charting Hitler's uh, aggressive moves against uh, other nations, the his taking of the Sudetenland, uh, Czechoslovakia, the Anschluss, um, with Austria, and with that the appeasement, the continued appeasement from Chamberlain in Britain and you know France etc. And of course at this time we also have the rise of Vyacheslav Molotov who becomes the Minister of Foreign Affairs and um, with Ribbentrop the, the German Foreign Secretary, 
the Ribbentrop Molotov Pact is made, in which Poland is um, is kind of split between Germany and Russia. It's an unlikely alliance between Nazi Germany and, and uh, communist USSR. But of course, Stalin is forever anxious about his borders on the West, so um, he's trying to keep uh, Nazi Germany, I suppose, on friendly terms, at least for the time being. So we also have here, um, obviously, the beginning of World War II, um, but also the beginning of the Winter War between Russia and Finland. And although Russia eventually came out on top, it was an incredibly poorly executed operation. And the Finns um, defended their country magnificently and caused all kinds of um, trouble for the Russians, including you know, a terrible death toll on the Russian side. So it was seen as a kind of a blunder, really, and a misjudgment, a miscalculation by Stalin and his generals. Stalin wants the kind of capitalist powers to fight amongst themselves, to weaken them. But the USSR is kind of courted, really, by the Allies and the Axis powers during the war to join with them, um, although no one trusts them, of course. There's all this disinformation going on, these spy networks, and although Hitler's forces are massed on the Soviet border, by this time Hitler has taken Romania and Hungary, etc. Stalin is slow to believe the reports. And he thinks that Hitler won't invade while he's still fighting Britain. Of course, he's proved to be wrong. And in the coda of the book, um, we have the very beginning of Operation Barbarossa, the first uh, Germans crossing the Russian border. So that's kind of really the skeleton of what this book's about. And as with the first book, it's absolutely fascinating. Um, Kotkin, Stephen Kotkin, I mean, goodness me, he just knows everything there is, it seems, about uh, Stalin. He's kind of authority uh, in how he writes, and the sources he uses, etc., uh, are just great, you know. And, and he's, he writes in such an engaging way. It's, it's not dry. It's, it's really readable. I mean, I looked forward to reading a bit every night. Um, it took me a while because it's a massive volume. But, um, you know, it's certainly not a boring read. Um, and it's just absolutely fascinating, absolutely terrifying as well how one person could create so much misery, so much death. But it also paints Stalin as somewhat of a, um, you know, it doesn't just paint him as a monster, he, although he is a monster, of course, but it, it's kind of, you know, you find out his little quirks about his personality as well, and his kind of friendships, his holidays. He seems to take a lot of holidays in the summer to so Sochi. Um, so you have a kind of well-rounded picture of Stalin. Um, but my goodness me, what a terrifying figure he comes across as in this central volume, which of course he was. Um, and Kopkin just does such a marvellous job. So don't be daunted by the size of this, and indeed by volume one. Um, you know, check them out. It's just, it's just great history writing and... Um, yeah, if you haven't read it, please, please consider it. It's such a fast, and I can't wait for volume three. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'll just leave you with a picture. This picture really speaks volumes. Um, this is a picture of Stalin and his, uh, and like the kind of main Bolsheviks, and uh, including Trotsky. And as Kotkin says, you know, almost everyone in this picture became were killed basically by Stalin during the, the terror. You know, all those people around him, all those colleagues, friends, etc. Really terrifying. Check it out, it's a great read, great book. Thanks for watching and uh, I just put on a brief slideshow of the structure of the book. Bye.